I'd like to welcome you to the well, actually the 11th class in uh, FIS 501, the UBC Ecosystem Modeling course. It's going to be speeding up a bit now, uh, both in the sense in the sense that we'll be spending more time on uh, hands-on, uh, but we'll still have a, a guest lecture every week for the next, I think, five weeks or so. The uh, plan for today is that uh, I'm going to give you an introduction to uh, time series fitting in ECOSIM. So uh, a brief, relatively brief, it actually might end up being close to an hour introduction to that with a presentation. And then I'm going to uh, open up ECOPART, ECOSIM, EWE, and run your true uh, a tutorial on uh, time series fitting. Uh, show you the steps for how to do that tutorial. And having said that, I should uh, apologize because in the schedule for the uh, for the for this uh, for today, up to half an hour ago, it said that we will be doing tutorial five, and that's a copy and paste mistake. I copied. Oh, I was going to change that to tutorial 5, time series fitting. Uh, so, if you have prepared yourself for number 5, you would uh, you would have been doing exactly what you were told to do, and that was a mistake. It sounds weird, but it is. So, uh, we're going to go through tutorial 4. And I've also put up an assignment number 2 for... Um, for two weeks from now, from those who hand in assignments, which you are basically all welcome to do, some have to do it. Um, that assignment is the tutorial we'll be talking about today, with a few questions added in. So, I'm going to show you what you need for the assignment. And I think that's perfectly fine, because time series fitting is really a very central aspect in many ways to what we are talking about in this entire course. It is the thing that shows that we actually can get uh, the models to behave and it's really crucial for us to get a handle on the status of the stocks, where they are relative to carrying capacity. But that's all of the topic for today, so you you get much more about that. Let me start now with my presentation. I want to acknowledge that we are at UBC at Coast Salish Territory. And we acknowledge that we are at the traditional, ancestral and unceded territories of the Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh and Squamish peoples. I would also encourage you to join the Slack workspace. You can email me for access if you don't have it already. And uh, last week was very relaxed in, in the workspace. It was reading week, but I very much encourage you to um, use the workspace and the channels there for asking questions and starting discussions. That way, um, it's, it's, that way more people will benefit from it uh, and don't feel shy to ask the simple uh, questions there because, as I said before, um, with this group of instructors, we can only answer very simple questions. If it's complicated, it's way beyond that. So uh, please, simple questions, ask them in workspace and uh, we'll get back to you or join us and we can uh, for, or contact us in other ways. Okay, um, I remind you again that the recordings are available at the Ecopart YouTube channel uh, and, if, and also on the Facebook, the recordings from Facebook Live will be on the Facebook and that all the lectures, assignments and tutorials are on a Google site. You can find it uh, if you go to this, uh, to this link here. I uh, hope you have done that already. And as the very last thing here before we start on the Echo Sim, a reminder, next class will be Natalie Sapetti from OGS in Trieste, that's up in northeastern Italy, if you don't know where it is. 
about cumulative effects from climate and fisheries in the talk. And that's uh, my introduction. So the uh, topic for the presentation today is Ecosim Time Dynamics and it's about fitting models to time series data. That's what we go through. And you've had quite a bit of introduction to that already. Uh, there was my initial uh, lecture, very first uh, class, where it was an overview of what we would be doing or would be doing throughout the class and some status for ecosystem modeling. There was Carl Walters' Forging Arena talk, uh, and also his uh, How to Build a Time Dynamic Model. Uh, we've had uh, we've had the, the talk from Dave Chakaris about Menhaven and how uh, he was fitting that model and uh, his demonstration of that. And last week, well, the week before uh, the reading week, we had Jacob Bentley uh, from the UK talking about his um, work on in the Irish Sea, which again included quite a lot about time series fitting. He also talked about the uh, module for, um, what's it called, the automatic time series fitting, the, the one that, um, well, I'll be talking about it a bit later in, in that discussion too, or in this uh, presentation too. So starting off with this, um, modeling predator-prey interactions. Again, this is something that uh, Carl talked about. What you should remember about this is that, or know about that is, at a minimum, that um, predator prey interactions are generally modeled with based on Lotka Voltaire assumptions, Lotka Voltaire model. The model goes back to the 1920s, about 100 years ago. And it says that you can estimate the consumption by a predator, and this is what we want to do when we're, de when we're dealing with ecosystem models. We want to figure out how much does predators eat, how much does a group eat. Based on the Lotka Voltaire assumptions, that means a predator's consumption, you estimate it from how many predators are there times how many prey are there times a constant, which is what we call a search rate. So more predators means more predator consumption. More prey means more prey consumption. That's the key assumption in it. And this basically is used for all uh, ecosystem models, all models with species interactions. It's hidden, it's in there somewhere in the assumptions. Now, we can use that and uh, we can then look at how uh, groups biomass change over time. And again, that's based on these Lotka Volterra mass interactions. So that what we're looking at here is how much does the abundance of the prey group change for each time step. That's what we want to estimate for all of the groups. We can estimate that or Lotka Volterra in its estimates that as it's a question of how many prey there are times a growth rate for it. Less how much, how many predators are there times how many prey are there times the search rate. So this is how much the predator eats. In this simple example we have one prey group and one predator group. It's easy to express it like this. But it doesn't really change if, it's, if there are many. Just more complicated. So, the change is we have a growth rate and we have a predator's feeding rate. And it's the difference between those two. Now these models, Lot Voltaire models, are very unstable. So when you run a model of this uh, kind, what you typically see is you have, let's say you start off and you have a lot of prey and you have few predators. Well, that's a lot of food, so predators are having a good time. And they're bringing the prey down, and at some point, whoops, there's so many predators that the prey collapse. And then, because the predators are, are long lived, they're going to uh, be okay for a while, and then they collapse too. And the prey stays down here. So now they all everything's collapsed. 
And then suddenly, pooh, the prey shoots back up again because there's no predators anymore. And they recover. It's exponential growth all the way down there. We just don't see it. We see them coming back. Oh, and then after a while we get into this again coming in from the other side here. So we have lots of prey and predators and we go into these cycles. Lots of all tear models behave like that. And that's not generally how the world behaves. So what can we do? Well, we can say, well, there might be some density dependence in that. So that's the next step here. We put in density dependence. We can look at it. How does a prey change over time? It's still the growth rate times the number of predators. But we just put in a cap that says something about carrying capacity. 1 minus the number of predators relative to its carrying capacity k. And you can see what that does. If n is very small, then this whole thing becomes 1. And then we're back to, oh, the same as up here. And if they are close to carrying capacity, n becomes equal to k, close to k. And we say 1 minus 1 is 0. And that means no growth. And there's only going to be the uh, predation on it. So that means it's going to be going down when it's up there. Or it's going to be just balancing because it's not going to be exactly the carrying capacity. Now, that dampens the uh, violent cycles, uh, but it doesn't remove it completely. And it's still these these equations are um, modern type is still very unstable. That's what Carl talked about, and, and the reason for why they gave up on them there. 30 years ago. One thing I want to mention here is what this means is that Lotka Voltaire is prey dependent first and foremost. The change in biomass of a group over time is a function of how many prey there are, how many out of that group times minus something else. It does include the predator, but the key about this is this is prey dependent. We we'll get back to that in, in a little while. Oh, uh, what really changed? Uh, I moved too far there. Fast there uh, was what Carl talked about with the Fortune Arena. Uh, that has changed how we model, how we how we uh, in, include the um, the Lot Voltaire model into the ecosystem models. Let's have a look at it. It's funny, I think it doesn't work here. Come on. Couldn't change the slide. And as Carl pointed out, in the foraging arena, what he's done is mainly a key aspect of that is that the prey can be in two different states, unavailable to predation or available to predations. We still have N prey. But some of them are available to predators. But one picture I want to get into your head here is the one that's the background on this blue slide. That's a, that's a coral reef. It's an old slide. It's a very poor quality, but I haven't found one that's better. And you can see the, the sky of, of the cloud of fish. Smaller ones close to the reef, bigger ones further away. That's very typical for when you look at a, a reef. These fish are all planktivorous and when a predator shows up they're going to be whoop, go back in and hide. So they stay close to the reef. They compete with each other. You can see the ones that are further out have more access to the plankton. They're all feeding on plankton that's been drifting, that's drifting with the currents to the reef. They are there for protection and they really compete with each other. That's worth thinking about. That's a really important part of the foraging arena, that there is this competition. And when they're out there, they're more available to predators than when they're hiding. But it's a, it's a dynamic process which is uh, something you have to have in your head. It's really difficult to go out in the field and measure. It's Measure it means measure these rates for how groups 
change from uh, being available to unavailable, especially there's this little v here, which is a behavioral exchange rate that we call vulnerability. And it's a key to how Ecosim works. The one here that regulates how quickly things change between being available and unavailable. And the implementation of that is a core aspect of the talk today. What it means is that the food concentration seen by predators should be highly sensitive to how many predators there are as well. The um, equation is set up here. You can see predation rate is calculated over on the right there as A times V times P predator. So exactly the same as I talked about before. And we have the invulnerable prey and the vulnerable prey. Now we can set this up and we can move it around and we can isolate what this tells us about how many prey are available. And that's the equation you have down here. And what I want you to notice in that is that where it before was prey dependent, it now becomes ratio, 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 ratio dependent. It's the ratio between prey and predators that's important. Can't talk much more about this. And this but again, this is really uh, it's an important aspect of it. But um, let's turn to some more practical aspects. There's biomass and size structure dynamics. I'll we'll talk more about the size structure dynamics uh, next. Basic is that with the biomass dynamics, we have a pool, and we are uh, just like we saw in Lotka Voltaire equations, they are kind of biomass equations. We have a pool, and it grows with this little r factor, which relates to the POV. That's how much uh, production there is in a given period, and that depends on this pool here. Um, when it's size structure dynamics, we use an age structured models instead, and uh, we used to set them up in the EWE framework. And they change this quite a bit how calculations are done. We use a mixed mixture of differential and difference equations, that's not really important. We're using echo parts as for the initial state and only for the initial state. We talked in previous classes about the um, Equipart master equations and they are also used, the same structure is used in Ecosim but implemented a little bit differently but they look very similar. Uh, so where we had that breakdown, uh, for instance, of production into how much is eaten by the predators, what's taken by the fish, what's the biomass accumulation, net migration, what's other mortality, those same things are used in Ecosim. Another thing about Ecosim is that um, it is a fast model. And part of that is we're using what's called variable speed splitting. Basically, uh, if you are dealing with a higher dynamic model, you have to look at what's the shortest time that, that can be used for things moving from one cell to another, and everything has to be scaled to that time. What we're doing with this variable speed splitting is a combination of what do we do when we have to model phytoplankton and say blue whales in the same model. Um, what kind of time step should we use? We generally we're using a month uh, time step in, in Ecosim. And for phytoplankton, that's way too fast. So the, for those with this variable speed splitting, the calculations are slightly different for this fast for the fast turnovers like phytoplankton. We look at the trajectory for those and then we project where they'll be in a month. And it actually works really well. And it makes it possible to make fast runs. And that's important because all models are wrong. All models implementation are wrong. They can be made better, they can be pretty good, but don't expect that you can from first principles say, oh, this is how things work inside the organisms and then we can scale up from there to the 
well, from the cell to the organism to a group and to the ecosystem and get things right. We can't do that. One key aspect of that is there's something called behavior that's involved and we just can't model that. No one can. So the cure for that is well try run many try again, try again, see how the models behave, get them to behave. Do you can do better. But if it takes a week to run a model How do you do that? That's, that's a challenge. Um, the philosophy in EWE is run, make the model runs fast and do them many times and figure out where the problems are. We were talking more about that. Enough about that. Let's go on. So we have the option for group, we can when we define the group, we can say that it's, and I'll show you where that is uh, in in the next hour, when we get to the Ecosystem time series fitting. But what we can do is we can go in and we can say that a group is a multi stanza group, and if it's a multi stanza, multi stanza just means there's more than one uh, size category, age category for that group. Uh, then we run we run it with monthly cohorts. And what happens to each of those cohorts, that decides what happens over time. So we can have them growing and then, I'll show that in actually the next slide, so we'll have to wait the next uh, hour for that. Um, we keep track of what happens over time this way. And one key aspect of that is that this makes recruitment an emergent property of competition. And uh, so we get stock recruitment relationships coming out of this. They're not predefined as they generally are in assessment models. They depend on what happens to the larvae, to the juveniles, to the young ones, to the recruits. And uh, that's what decides um, that's what decides how good the recruitment is going to be. So the stock recruitment relationship is one that's emerging based on that. The way it's set up is first, when you define your groups, you can go in and then you can, as in this case here, this snook here, it's down from Florida uh, model, we have five that are called snook. What ties them together is when we get over here to the multi stanza group name. The first time we did this, we just have written snook there. And for the next four, just to make sure everything was spelled the same way, that we will use this little uh, flip down uh, little button there and then found snook down here for the second, the third, and the fourth, and the fifth stanza. We would have checked that and then we would say stanza age, when do they enter into it? The first one is at zero, the next one is at three months, and then it's 12 months, and 48 months, and 90 months, and beyond. So that's how we set up, or how do we define a multi stanza group. Pretty much straightforward. Once that gone, one go, done, I can go in to this nice little additional one with, with Jerome's baby pram there next to it, uh, and say edit multi stanza. And when we do that and go in, and you can find in this case here, the seventh multi stanza group is called Snook. So it's not the, we still have the five stands within it, it's just there are six other of these uh, in this model here. So for this one here, we have a few basic things. We, we know something, we have the uh, from battle and to growth parameter k, uh, which is the only thing we really need to worry about right now. Um, then for each of those, we define the things down at the bottom. We enter a leading biomass. Oh, that was the wrong button. Definitely. We enter a leading biomass, so down here. That means we enter the biomass for one group. In this case here, it's for the first stage we enter a biomass. We also enter mortality rates, and we have to do that for all of the stanza. Then we enter consumption biomass ratio for one group. That's a leading QB, so it's only for the first one, and that's what goes in here. The program will then calculate 
based on the growth patterns, what, it, what that means for the other parameters, for the other stanza, and they become consistent that way. And that will probably give you some headaches, in the sense that, oh, I don't have enough juveniles to meet the predator's demands. But this is actually realistic, that it is like that. It does assume that when you start the model, you have a balance in the age structure. If that's not the case, you may have to go and think about if the, if the biomass is decreasing or increasing at that point. And we tend to be able to get it to, to work. But um, it puts some constraints on your model, and constraints are good for modeling. That's what makes you go back and consider your data. Now, there's a nice plot here, which has age, and then some, well, normalized value we call them here. They scale to one to the biggest value. What you can see here is, first of all, the von Bertelanti growth parameter K results in individual weight growth, growth and weight. That's the blue line. So this is how an individual will grow over the, those 120 months that are represented here, 10 years. It will grow up to that asymptotic weight. Now the red line here is how many there are in the cohort. So we start out with a certain number in the cohort and then they die off at the rate expressed by the red there. That's, that's the number. And if you have the number and you multiply it with the weight of the individual, you get the population biomass. That's the black curve on it. So that's the population size. That was come out of this over time. And then you have also some a few more things. You have those uh, vertical lines. The green ones just indicate uh, the separation between the stanza. And the stippled yellow one is when they should start spawning according to the information you've given them. And that information includes this uh, weight at maturity relative to weight, the inf uh, weight in W infinity, whatever that's called. It's here set to 0.25, that gives us this line there. But we've actually now uh, replaced that kind of or at attitude spawning proportion here. So you can have that, oh no, they won't start spawning until they reach 48 months. Um, this is especially important for looking, for instance, at salmon, which you know they, they don't spawn out in the ocean. They only spawn when they get back. So you can have, you can make sure they spawn the right place, at the right stanza this way here. So that's the multi stanza in your introduction to those. Uh, the way um, biomass dynamics work in EcoSim is just like in EcoPath, basically. You see that first equation here, biomass dynamics. It says the change in biomass for any given group over time, the BDT change in biomass equals production, less predation, less fishery, less net migration, less other mortality. Um, had we been in the uh, in the small room now, uh, as we used to be, I would have said, so what is uh, dB over dt? And expected the answer biomass accumulation. That's the change in biomass. So in e what does it correspond to in ecopart? That's what I've asked you. In ecopart, this corresponds to biomass accumulation. So this is exactly the same equation. This is that that is an ecosim. It's implemented differently, but it's the same. Now, when we are working in uh, in EcoSim, we're getting various information from EcoPart, like starting biomass. The in the Lotka Voltaire there was something called the search rate. Well, we can actually estimate the search rate, the effective search rate, from the EcoPart parameters because the EcoPart parameters tells us with this predator biomass and prey biomass and these vulnerabilities we have that much consumption by this predator on this prey. So that gives us an estimate for the search rate in combination with the vulnerability. Uh, so that's one thing we get from, from there. Another thing we get from them is that what we call the gross food conversion efficiency. 
briefly um, in abbreviated G, which is the production consumption ratio. And the way what we do in Ecosem is we estimate the consumption. We multiply the GE on top of that. So we estimate the consumption from the forging arena assumptions. Multiply that with the gross fruit conversion efficiency and that gives us the production for that group. Fair enough? That's about it. That's the real brief version of what Ecosem is doing. So what Ecosem does, it predicts changes in mortality rates as sum of what fishing and predation mortalities. The predation mortalities then varies with how many predators are there, how much time do the, predator, the prey sp uh, feed, uh, spend feeding, and some functional response assumptions. That we can vary and talk more about that later. Now, in addition to this, we can impact the uh, total mortality by what's happening in the environment. Are there good environmental conditions? And we can also use something called mediation, which we'll talk about in just a few minutes. But this is what you have to have in your mind is that we estimate the mortality rates, this corresponds to production, as fishing plus natural mortality. And that natural mortality includes not just predation, it's also other mortality. Which Ecosim has to assume is constant. Now, we can predict consumption. We, we do predict consumption based with, with, with an equation. And here we started off with, when, when Ecosim started years ago, it was with the equation you see up there on top. And through a number of workshops, uh, questions or questions came about how do we handle this and this and this. Uh, it led to the, uh, the second equation. And that second equation there hasn't changed in 20 years. There's been a few things, there's been a number of things added that we can, we can, um, um, to give it more flexibility. But it's not really in the equation that they, that, that has changed because of that. It's more, or oh, we can poke it in different ways. So this includes notably uh, environmental impacts and behavioral impacts related to what we call mediation. That's two of the really key aspects of this. In momentum forcing, uh, we can force nutrient supply, we can force prime production, secondary production, or whatever you uh, have information about, or, are in, or think is appropriate to do. We can get that information from a hydrographic model. This here is nutrient loading in Chesapeake Bay from a simple hydrodynamic model. And it really, when, when we put that in to, uh, to that model years ago, it led immediately to the sum squared residuals, so observations less estimates squared, go, uh, dropping to half of the value that there was this increase in, in nutrient flow there in the 80s, that's uh, based on agriculture. And then it was cleaned when it, uh, 20 years later, uh, they started cleaning up and nutrient levels fell again. This had direct impact, so we could see that propagating through the food web. Um, this is actually a good example because we had to make that simple model. Even though the Army Corps of Engineers had a really detailed model of Chesapeake Bay, but it could only, they had only run it for, how many months was it? I think it was 18 months, but very fine details. And 18 months when you're working with ecosystems is like instantaneous. 18 months doesn't provide any um, any uh, contrast as we're looking for and we need to uh, so generally we need to run these models over a longer time to get populations to change to see the differences between different states of the ecosystem. So we made this one here that ran 50 something years and a uh, very quick simple model and it gave a picture that seemed to be have a big impact on the ecosystem model, 
possibly explaining things, which, I mean, nutrient loading, it seems quite reasonable. So long time series should be used for contrast when you're working with this. You don't expect that you can get everything out of looking at, oh, I have three years of good data for this ecosystem. Um, unless those three years was one in the 50s, one in the 80s, and one now, and that kind of, if there well, really is contrast, that, that would help a lot. Um, but having uh, 2017, 18, and 19 represented in the model generally is is not well. It's not ideal. Not just generally. That's not that's not ideal when we're talking about an ecosystem. We need the long time series. So the uh, environmental forcing we have, we can force salinity to temperature and so, or, or you name it, anything doesn't matter. Because we don't go into the details of what they do, we're just looking at the functional response of what they do. So for oxygen, it's not um, how oxygen works in the body. It's a question of what, what, how does the productivity, how does the productivity impact it? So what we need is simply to define a functional response curve, like you see here. This here is the as a momentum forcing with whatever units is appropriate. Uh, that in this case here 10, 15, 20, that's temperature for French Bay, and this is the response of something to that. So that's the kind of, of environmental forcing that we need to, to put in. And it's being used in ecosystem and ecospace exactly the same responses, of course. Fair enough. Mediation is the next thing we're getting to. And um, This actually is something that started with a failure. And there was a working group down in, let's see if I can get, I'm looking for my, ah, that was my Zoom annotate. This is something that started down in, uh, in uh, Santa Barbara. There was a working group, Jim Kitschow, Carl Wolters, and a number of other were in that working group. And they were working with uh, some place out in the central North Pacific, I think, a big tuna model. And in that model, they had that um, the tuna fishery, which they modeled throughout the history of tuna fishery, led to a decline in small pelagics. And then the model said that benefits albatrosses. The tuna fishery is benefiting albatrosses because there's going to be more small pelagic for albatrosses. Both albatrosses and tuna eat these small pelagics. Common prey, shared prey. So that was what the model said, and everyone was all the fisheries people were, oh, that seems reasonable. But there was, when they presented this, NCEAS, N -C -E -A -S, that's what that's what the institute is called. When they um, when they um, presented that, there was a blood scientist there and she said, no, that's not what has happened. We've seen albatross decline during this period. And it's not, it was not because of bycats, as you might think. Uh, something else. So what they they thought about it, and then they came up with something. Now you see this stippled line up here on 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 the plot. That's now the water surface. Now it shouldn't be the water surface. Let's make another water surface instead. This is the water surface because it's out in the Pacific, so big waves. So that's um, that's the water. And this is the albatross. So the albatrosses are flying here, and uh, the small pelagics. Whoops. They don't, oh, that doesn't look like small platics. They're here. Now the tuna, they are uh, they are pretty deep, usually, because they don't um, they don't tolerate the warmer water, the surface variables. When you have this, they're staying down a hundred meters or so, and then they make sporadic uh, excursions up here, and they go down below again. And if there are lots of tuna around. Uh, they are going to be scaring the um, small pelagics up to the surface. Remember, fish are smart. Animals are really smart, and they are scared. That's the whole concept around the foraging arena. So the tuna are going to be scaring the small pelagics up to the surface. The albatrosses can't dive very far. They can take things which are close to the surface, but they do not dive deep. So they actually depend on tuna to 
push the uh, small palatis up to the surface. Small palatis can tolerate those warmer waters and they are pretty uh, they're scared. Living in the ocean is living in uh, is living in fear generally. So this interaction here we can model it. Uh, the interaction between that the impact that tuna has on the feeding interaction here. We can model that. We can model that by simply making a function response that says, now this is tuna biomass. If there are few tuna, then there's going to be little. Now over here is going to be this energy flow here. So this flow here is what we put on this axis. And here how we have a number of tuners, pretty much straightforward. No tuner, no interaction. So we can draw a shape for how that looks. And you can do it just as well as anyone else because this is something where we haven't... It's not the focus of research hasn't been very much. It's been, it, we've been seeing more of this kind of research about mediation actually come, uh, appearing because of, of, of because we're drawing attention to it with the modeling that this is the kind of information we're interested in. But I hope you can see the, uh, the, the what what this implies and 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 this is something this mediation is something really fundamental that certainly doesn't enter into the thinking for Lotke Voltaire models what actually is important and it can be used for a lot of different things. Um, Piscivores macroalgae juvenile fish over there on the right that refers to how um, kelp may serve as hiding places for juvenile fish and thus make juvenile fish less available to the predators. So in that case uh, if we were going, to, if we were going to model that, we would have something about well, with lots, if we curve the looks just the other way, it would look. If that was the one we were we were modeling, that, that second one here, we would do something like this. This would be kelp, and this here would be the feeding interaction. We would say lots of kelp would be little interaction, so it would actually go the other way. Something that looks a bit like that. Now, should it be like this, or should it be like this, or should it be uh, like this? Doesn't that's something you can try? What you, when you're working with this in it, the only thing in addition to what I talked about here, you need to do is basically you have to say, well, when we started the model, there was a lot of tuna. If we go back to that example, so you have to say the echo park baseline and do that on the plot actually. It's a stippled vertical line. You go in and you say, this is our Ecopark baseline. So we're using that information to get started, to know where we are on this plot. That's about it, actually. But there's lots of different things it can be used to. Uh, trawling may resuspend um, nutrients up into back up in the water, and that may increase prime reduction. Uh, shading. Um, if you have, um, when you have a system where you have a lot of primary production phytoplankton that causes shading on the macroalgae, now if you in such a system in have an in, um, invasion of drisnids or small mussels and that kind of things, they lead to clear water and that then leads to macroalgae having a much better time because suddenly they have access to nutrients and they have access uh, because of the, the because there's clear water they grow much better. Um, that kind of things, you can easily model that with um, mediation. How the shapes look, oh, you, have to, you really have to work with that, but it's quick. You can try different things, you can see what the impact is, you can look at sensitivity to different shapes and find something that has the right behavior. And that's what we're looking for. There is no uh, absolute truth in what we're doing. It's a question of getting it right. So the having that sense for what's right is 
key aspects for what you're uh, looking for when you're developing expertise in this area. Building on the past. I think I used that title because what we're doing with the time series fitting is to replicate ecosystem history. And for that, the, uh, the key is data. We like data. And data can be lots of different kinds. It doesn't need to be hard measurements from um, from um, surveys done every year for the last 50 years. As Jacob Bentley talked about last time, actually they got a lot of information from fishermen about how um, how things have developed over time. That's data too. And, and you can use that kind of data. You just need to know that um, sometimes the scaling, as in, in Jakob's example, the trend was, was right, and generally that's the case, but the scaling for how much it varied, that may be, um, that may be a bit, uh, that may not be as clear in that kind of, of data, which are not measurements of fish and, and you know, counting them, counting the estimates of the zooplankton production, which is highly variable too. I don't know what's a good example of this, nutrients maybe. Um, there's a lot of different kind of data. We can get a lot of that from signal speech assessments and our surveys. And we, we have to use all the information we can get and evaluate how useful it is. We can, in addition to this, we can do anomaly fitting for uh, productivity, recruitment, catches, or, or, or things like that. And we'll talk more about that in the coming. This is one of my favorite slides. It's from Kenya. I think it's what's it called, Lake Turkana or something like that. And there's a lot of flamingos. This is a foraging arena. These flamingos are up here uh, and they are walking around and they are eating atemia, pine shrimps. Those atemia are produced out there in the deeper part of the lake. And these Flamingos are patiently waiting for advection to move the brine strips in where they can eat them. And my question to you is, had there been only half as many birds, would they eat only half as many Artemia? These flamingos are overwintering down in Kenya. So they come up from Mediterranean or wherever they are, and they uh, they come they come down here and they feed down here. I think they breed down here too. Oh, they do that up there. Anyway, they come down here and they feed down here. Now, if one year only half as many came back, you can see here, at this point here, they must be pretty close to carrying capacity. They are totally dependent on this artemia coming in from the deeper water. The um, If there was only half of them, each of them would eat more maybe twice as much i think i think that's a fair assumption here but if there were only what if there were only um this many flamingos coming back one year can you imagine that if this many flamingos suddenly had that whole ecosystem and all the Artemia production to themselves. Then, well, before we saw that the half that came back, they would be able to eat twice as much. But now, would they be able, let's say there's 100 coming back, would they be able to eat a uh, hundred times as much? And there you would say, no, they probably can't. That's, that's too much. In this case, they're too far from carrying capacity. That's the kind of things you need to think about, where they are. And that relates to this really easily misunderstood and poorly defined question of top-down and bottom-up controls. Those two concepts are poorly defined, typically. I'm pretty sure if I asked, what do you think this system here, is this top-down control or is it bottom-up control in this system here? Would anyone dare to give an answer to that? Just unmute yourself and say top down or bottom up.
Is it top oh. down? See, this is the obvious answer to the question, and it's wrong. Mm -hmm. This system here is totally dependent on artemia production. Artemia production mainly dependent on the rivers, how much nutrients, how much rain is going to be in the area. That's a bottom-up process. So when you are at carrying capacity like these are, you are totally dependent on what happens to the carrying capacity. Carrying capacity is not fixed in stone. It may look like that when we're setting up a simple Lotka Voltaire model, this is the carrying capacity. And when we talk about carrying capacity, like they do an assessment, they're talking about B0, the unfit biomass. B0 is non-existing. There is no reference point that says what is the biomass under carrying capacity. That's what's implied in it, because carrying capacity depends on environmental productivity. It changes. In most ecosystems, we see these dec in many ecosystems, we see decadal changes in carrying capacity. Stronger, more productive periods and less productive periods. So in this case here, this system, when you have this many flamingos in it, is dependent on the um, environmental productivity. How much rain is there? How many nutrients are coming out to here? out there. that This is what matters. It's what happens out there. That's what the Artemia is, is breeding and producing and advection will move some of them up on the shallows. The uh, flamingos has absolutely no control over that. That's a question of wind, rain, advection and productivity of the uh, brine shrimp. If we were in this situation here where we have only 100 of the flamingos or 1000 of the flamingos coming back. That would be, in my interpretation, top-down control. Top-down control means that twice as many, if you, if you, we can go to the absolute extreme and say, it's only those four there that come back. Those four came there. If there had been eight instead, the eight would eat twice as much as four. So uh, when you're far from carrying capacity, more predators means more uh, prey consumption. That is that is what we call uh, top-down control. When you change the number of predators, it has an impact on the prey consumed. That's what's usually used. and. It's confusing that they don't have control, but they really don't, not compared to, they, they don't because they're depending on the environmental productivity. What is important is the carrying capacity. That's what we're looking for. The thoughts about the implications for carrying capacity and what this means. Because what you're trying to do with your ecosystem model is to predict what's going to happen if the biomass of this group changes from this year to next year. And if you think about the flamingos, what this means is you have to think about how many flamingos are there? How far are we from carrying capacity? That's what counts. That's what you have to think about. So if you know, uh, I only have, I have so few flamingos. I only have this little bit of flamingos here. There's plenty of food for them. So uh, if they have a good spawning season and more of them came back because of that, so suddenly instead of being that many, there'll be uh, 5%, 10% more. Then they would eat 10% more. But if it is close to carrying capacity, if you have all of those you see here coming back and they had good uh, feeding conditions, so they brought a lot of juveniles back. And instead of being a zillion flamingos came back, it was 1.1 zillion. Each of those 1.1 zillion would only have one or 1.8 times the food. They would eat less because they are at carrying capacity. And when you are at carrying capacity, there is no more. The, the pie is no bigger. 
So that's the kind of thinking that is really important for the most important parameter in the time dynamic modeling, the vulnerability. Favorite graph. It's very old. What it shows is on the x-axis, predator abundance. And you see that what's being added to it is no flamingos and carrying capacity. So this is the graph that shows all the way from nothing to carrying capacity. The pred predicted predation mortality is out in the y-axis. How much predation mortality they're causing on the, on the prey. So that's the consumption divided by the biomass of the prey. In Ecosim, there's a cap on that. An asymptotic plot here, line here that um, goes up to, at carrying capacity, it hits the ceiling. You cannot cause bigger predation mortality on the prey. The only way that, can, that you can change uh, the consumption of the predator is if you change the environmental productivity. So that's what can bring that curve up or down, is changes in momentum productivity, changes in carrying capacity. That's what can result in how much they can do, but, but that's about it. The traditional one up there is a linear one. That's the, that's the Lotka Voltaire. That's what you see in most uh, ecosystem model. They basically say more predators means more predation. It's linear with them, not ratio dependent as an ecosystem. So that's a big difference. To use this in ecosystem, we need one piece of information. We need to know where we are on that axis. And you can think back to the flamingos again, and you would say, oh, in the flamingo case, we were out there on the right. Uh, but that's what we need to know. If we have that, we can run ecosystem. So, we need to know where the echo part baseline is. And then we can see what the impact is. So we, we put in the point for baseline and then we go, see if I can find it, down there. We say, okay, we, we say where we are on this axis and we go up and then we can read over here. And what we read is basically the ratio between those two, the blue divided by the red, and that is two, if you look at them. The predicted predation mortality at carrying capacity divided by the echopart baseline is two. Two is the answer. It's not 42. For ECOSIM, two is the answer. Two is the default in ECOSIM. It's a very hard assumption. It says the most that a predator can increase the predation it's causing on its prey is with a factor of two. If this predator was to grow to its carrying capacity, then it could only double the predation mortality it's causing on its prey. So in the Lake Turkana example that we just saw, we are way over on the right over here. We are at the point close to carrying capacity where more predators don't mean more predation mortality. It just means more competition. This is what we need to do to tell Ecosim where we are on that axis. So when we're fitting to vulnerabilities, this is what we're looking for. And down here at the bottom of the screen, you can see on the right side, we are bottom-up situation. It is the environmental productivity that dictates how much food there's going to be for the predators. And that means low vulnerability. That means some one and low means something close to one. When you're over on the left part of it, where we have the top-down control in our terminology, top-down is because two sharks eat twice as much as one shark of flamingos. Uh, so if sharks are very far from the, uh, they've been fished down, 
if they are very far from their carrying capacity, we are out there. And that means, yeah, so two will eat twice as much as one. It means it, it turns it into lot cavalier equations. It's very close to that. We'll get out of this. It's prey dependent. It, it, not ratio dependent that we get out there. So it's much more unstable. This is what we've done to many of our ecosystems. We moved them from being close to carrying capacity to being far from carrying capacity. That's a much more unstable situation. If you if we take the uh, be it the sharks, well let's take the sharks here. If pretty slow producing, but something is praise some uh, group that's far from its carrying capacity. Um, if it has a good recruitment one year, uh, there's going to be food for those recruits and they're going to grow and the population is going to shoot back quickly. But if you increase fishing a little bit on that group, uh, those that are left are not going to see much better condition because they are in a situation where there's plenty of food. They're far from carrying capacity. Hence, there's less competition, there's less density dependence. That's a very unstable situation we are in there. We are far from carrying capacity. So this, this is uh, an implication of where we are and what this graph is telling us and what Ecosystem is telling us. So, vulnerability, that really important parameter. If a predator population grows to its carrying capacity, how many times will, will the predation mortality it's causing on its prey increase? When you're out there, you cannot increase that predation mortality. It relates to prey consumption. You cannot increase that anymore. That's what it means to be at carrying capacity. So Ecosim, we're using it replicating the, the, the past. And we learned something from fitting models to time series data. I talked quite a bit about that the, in the very first class we had when I also showed this drawing here. That's one where we talked about how we learned that in order to replicate the history we need to consider the food web interactions, we need to consider how we are impacting those by fishery, and we need to consider how environmental productivity changed, that we need all three aspects in general to be included when we're fitting to these time series data. We are also finding that changes in environmental productivity can be amplified to a food web. I'll illustrate that in one of the next slides. So here is an example from Strait of Georgia, where you can ask questions like, are the seals causing this decline in, in Georgia Strait? Or is it fishing, or is it environmental change, or a combination of all of these? The models will not give you proof of any of this, but they may be used to analyze to illustrate is it plausible is it possible and if you're thinking about evaluating say for instance here in this case what's the impact of the harbor seals well if you can't make that uh, assumptions about the impact work in a relatively simple model as we're talking about here what's the chance that reality that will work in reality as in for instance cutting seals if it doesn't work in the model, what's the chance it'll work out there? Um, this, this is something we can use models to test. It's no proof at all, but we can use the models to see, to answer what if questions. That really is key to, well, to model use. That's kind of trivial. But that's uncertainty. Let me illustrate that with, with a really complex example here from Gulf of Mexico, what we did for the Fisheries Management Council, where there was a bycast of one of the really important species for the billion dollar uh, recreational fishery for red snapper. There was a bycast problem with Juno red snapper. That's the one you see up there on the top that don't look very much like the add-ons. Pretty rare at all, so I can't even find them up there, but you can see them. So let me. Um, now, there was talk back here, we're talking about something years ago. You can see the graph stops around 2000, to early 2000s, it was 2005, I think. So what we did was, uh, in this case here, we tried to do six to three different fits to the model. 
and we start with an unfished one, just look at what it, it does. So here we are um, modeling the impact, we're modeling the biomass of red snapper uh, from 1950 up to 2005. And we're running two runs. The black one is with continued shrimp fishing all the way through. And the model then, and then the uh, in the second run, which is the blue line, when we get to this point in time here, 1990, we stop fishing shrimps. We close the shrimp fishery, and then we get a different trajectory. You see, there's a difference between the blue and the black on this. Now, when we're doing fitting, we can estimate different numbers of parameters. And the top right one is no fitting. Vulnerabilities are all at the default value and the environment is a flat line. There's no change over time. We can then estimate more vulnerability parameters as we go down here. Whoops. Until 59, we've estimated one for each group in the system. So one for each. And this gives us, you see, so we look at the first column, you can see the different trajectories. It is oh, actually, it does more effect when we get down to the bottom than there is up at the top. Interesting. Now, we can also fit for environmental change the other axis, and we fit that per number of forcing function parameters. So, there's maybe spline point as, um, was it Dave and Jacob? Or, or Jacob? One of them were talking about spline points. I think it was uh, uh, Jacob. Uh, we can do 5 or 10 or 20 or 30 or 40 or I can't see what it says out here. Uh, or all of them. That's probably as many as there are years. And you see as you do that, uh, you get all, when you get all to the right, you have much more resolution. It's individual years. And it gets more and more resolution as you do that. So when you look at this, and, you, and uh, the Gulf for Management Fishersman's parcel didn't like this at all because it was basically we can't tell. The reason why we can't tell if it works or not is that is as you see here the red stars here indicate where there is no effect of changing no effect being less than a certain percentage of change of closing the fishery for shrimps and if you put in a diagonal across here uh, it's something uh, well the diagonal from 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 this corner to up this corner all but one of the red stars are up in the top right. That's where it mainly is driven by the environment. That's where the, there's more detail on the environment up there roughly than in the lower left. So if the um, impact here is on red snapper, if red snapper is driven by the environment, uh, then um, it's not going to have any effect. If it's more driven by uh, carrying capacity considerations, well, then closing the fishery may have an effect. We couldn't tell at that point what was the case here. So it was a warning signal. But I hope it illustrates also that there is no perfect model here. You may, you will have to try different things and look at sensitivity. That's how it works. It's a bit complex. But that's on purpose that I'm showing it. To, 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 just to illustrate, no, we don't just do a run and say, oh, this is what the model tells us. We look at the sensitivity. What I like to do is uh, fit the model, see what it tells me, what does it say about carrying capacity, and throw it away and start again. And you gradually build some experience from that for what it tells us. And being quite clear about there is no perfect fit that is the truth. Uh, there is, we have to look at the sensitivity when we do this. We have to look at what kind, what are the strong signals? When can you get it to work? When do those things break down? It's a bit more complicated than just fit the model and, and hallelujah. So Everson likes time series data. There's a lot of different time series data. It's described in the manual it described on the website, on the data part of it, and I encourage you to check it out. 
and notice that there are two kind of, 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 of values. There are drivers, fish mortality, fleet efforts, and on. They are used, the drivers are used to drive the model. So when you use those, you can't do it from not just every now and then. If you use fish mortality to uh, to drive it, f so you have an f 0.5 and one year 0.6, the next year 0.7, next year you can't have a, a blank and then put in 0.7 again because the blank what what is exactly I'm going to do zero average of the raw ones well you have to tell it computers are stupid so smart but they're good at what they do but you have to make sure drivers have to have values for every year for validation that's reference values so biomass relative biomass is often used there uh, you can say that in 1950 there was one in 1960 there was 0 0.8 and in 19 you know another year or you can have survey estimates for every year or for every three years or you can have um, well I think there used to be about twice as many sharks in this area as there are now okay two points now those two points can actually be much better than having nothing if you have nothing your model can do whatever it wants to do when it fits that group those two put constraints on it there were more back then than there are now that's the kind of things that can go in so validation reference values it's fine just to have for some years drivers you need for every year oh this getting complicated it's in the paper 2008 the core of this is just we have a procedure for, for what we can do and that procedure is one that uh, is very much in line with how things are estimated in, uh, in assess how things are done in assessments but here we also explicit about uh, you need to evaluate it when you see a run you see oh there are things that don't work and you go in and you change that that's the judgmental evaluation down the bottom we're just making it clear in this graph figure here that there is this you don't just make a model and you run do all of these you look at the results you go back and you think about it and you figure out uh, are the things wrong when things are wrong the model runs that's when we really learn something because then there is something we can fix so um, this is actually pretty neat i'm not trying to uh, say anything contrary to that it's a very it's a, it's a neat procedure it's uh, stood the test of time it works well so time series we um, we put them in the csv files uh, they are csv file made in excel the longer time series the better yeah we, we do need contrast and we get that from having things changed over time um, if you have two time series for the same thing and one goes one way and the other goes the other way you have to look at that you can't uh, think about what you put into a time series that's what i'm saying with, with that thought uh, bullet point here that um, if they are conflicting you have to evaluate them you can't expect a pro you can't expect any program to sort that out for you um, unless you're putting in uh, readings if, you, you can if you're putting in readings from uh, a thousand uh, measurements stations and uh, and you need to find the outliers and that kind of thing sure but if you put in two biomass series for a group uh, from two different survey types or cpue and from the surveys you have to say something about what what you have more faith in and you can put weight on it as you see up on on the spreadsheet there how much weight you put on um on the different time series which there happen to be one and zero and zero zero is because these are reference values they're not drivers it's only the drivers what this matters no sorry it's the other way around of course it only matters for uh, for the reference values you'll also note that there's a pool code pool because it can be a group or a fleet and that is a reference to what it is in your echo sim model so you have to make sure that uh, they actually fit those numbers with 
uh, that they link up to the right place. Here are the types. Relative biomass is really important, as is the drivers, which uh, often is effort of fish mortality. You will have to study that on your own. Um, we can force, and we talked about this already, uh, time series fitting, let's not go there. How it's implemented, you see that here, but actually I would much rather show it to you in um, in ECOSIM, but we have the nice navigator on the left, ECOSIM, there's input, there's output, there's tools, and in those tools we have the fit to time series. Um, we'll get there in a little while. Let me just mention it right now here, something that uh, Jakob talked quite a bit about two weeks, ten days ago, when talked about the colors down there that those colors means find me a vulnerability. They, that's all they mean. So this is when the program guard search in this case here it's going to search for each of the first for the first nine groups it's going to estimate one vulnerability it's one estimate for how long how far this um, group is from its carrying capacity. If it comes back with one it means it's close to carrying capacity. If it comes back with a thousand or ten thousand, it just means this group is far from its carrying capacity. So those are numbers that we estimate. Uh, you can see on the iteration in the center there, once completed, one start comes first and then one completed, and it gives us a sum squared residuals um, after a while. That is, can be used for evaluating the, uh, the runs, as we'll talk more about with the tutorial. Just want to warn you about overfitting. Illustrating that with here, I take, um, I just drawn random numbers around the line there. So it's just a line. What what would be on the line? Straight line plus minus a, a random number. If you fit that with two parameters, you can get the the nice fit, and that fit is really perfect. The one with the black line. But you can see what happens if you try to go outside the area. You're much better off or three parameters. You're much better off with a two fit parameter, one from the red line. Even though it's not a perfect not some squares is bigger for that model, but you're estimating one less parameter. And you see what happens when you when you project outside the range, uh, only one of them will work. It's just a warning to remember to talk about the overfitting. Something that Jacob talked about and something you really have to be uh, careful about. Um, it's very easy to go out and overfit and when you do that you are fitting to noise. And the capability of your model is that it's going to be less uh, reliable for, um, for future. Jacob talked about the automated stepwise fitting. It's a nice routine. It, uh, it's there when you really want to try a number of different things. I'm just highlighting that it's there. Uh, Jakob presented it. so You can go back to that recording and, and get the update on it. It's here just as a placekeeper. Um, I have one more thing and I'm really inclined to skip it and uh, go straight. Uh, since we only have half an hour uh, back all I'll say about it is um, this is an example about how the show illustrates how important uh, the productivity can be. At some time, we've seen cases where environmental signals can be amplified through the food web. This here is a model from the Benguela, a model at, uh, that. Um, that's fitted has been fitted to time series data for the whole period, no, not the whole period, from 1950 up to 2005 or something like that. So it's fitted, this entire model is fitted to time series data. So I took that model and I, with all the vulnerabilities and everything, and I just removed the drivers and I put in one driver which was 
increasing primary production with 20%, increasing environmental productivity with 20%. And what happened in the, it's Lynn Shannon's model, by the way, what happened in the, uh, in the, uh, this case was, so plankton took off initially, and then they went down again. And then, uh, because anchovy and sardines would build up fairly quickly, being over, uh, still 10 years before the, you see anchovy and sardine topping up there. So they built up uh, next there. You see, you see them up there. Anchovy, sardine. Oh, come on, this is slow. I don't know what's going on. Um, next thing you see is that the. Um, is snook, a, a, a piscivore, uh, increases as well, coming after it, it feeds on anchovy and sardine. And then we see seabirds, they are also increasing. And when we get to the end of it, we're seeing that a 20% increase in prime productivity can lead to a 70% increase in sardine. So that's amplification. And we see these signals. We see signals propagating through the food web. And that's a really important aspect of this, that when we have all these different times, this here, now this here is showing that you're kind of uh, in reverse, just to illustrate amplification. But an important aspect of a time series fitting is that we're finding signals when we're estimating the prime production anomalies. We're seeing signals propagate through the food web. And those can be stronger than the changes in the environmental productivity as estimated here through primary production. So there is something really fundamental behind this. There's some questions in the chat. And maybe we should address those before we, we go. Uh, yeah. There was one a uh, while back uh, when you were dealing with the multi stanza groups. And the question was by Bia, and she said, what is your suggestion uh, to when you have a really high mortalities for older stances, mainly driven by fisheries mortality? Does that put constraints into the assumptions of s uh, total mortality equals to PV? No, it does not. And a really high mortality, uh, well, check your numbers that it actually is correct. Uh, if it is a multi stanza group, you probably will not have the really high mortality on, on the younger stages um, or some other stages. We have, there are, we have cases where really high mortality on the juveniles, but not on the adults. And the other way around, if it's really high on all of the stanzas, it essentially means you you don't have that group anymore. It's going to be gone from the system. Uh, then Carly asks about the equation for the ecosim. Uh, what does DF handling time mean? What is it referring to? The handling time, uh, this goes back to something I sneak out to talk about with the uh, um, Bas Hollings uh, functional responses, uh, where you know there were three types of functional responses. One, the one is the hockey stick, the, the, the thing that works for spiders. Uh, the more insects there are, the more they take up to a certain point, and then the, the web is saturated and they can't eat anymore. That gives us a, uh, this kind of hockey stick. Type two is with a functional response that relates to what's called Hollings disk equation. And that's basically where um, a predator spends a uh, major part of the time handling the prey, the time that's used for uh, eating and digesting the prey where it may not be active. So that's the kind of, that's the handling that, can, that comes in that we can uh, put into um, ecosystem by, by invoking this handling time. And one can, the, the third, kind is uh, uh, prey switching, which is more how ECOSIM works. And um, that's one where a predator may have, may ignore prey at, at very low abundance and then take them increasingly as they get more abundance. So its search pattern may change based on whether it sees the prey or not. It, but you know, when a predator is focused on the search pattern and the behavior of one type of prey 
when do they come up to feed and so on. It may ignore those that come up to feed at another different time of the day, if that's the case, or another, in another part of the habitat it goes after this specific kind. That's why prey switching really comes in. Okay, and we have two more questions. One is, uh, oh, actually three more questions. Uh, what is nutrient supply for if primary production is also an, exter an externally forced? Oh, uh, it's just you, you have the option. You can have uh, you can feed in with nutrients uh, and then use uh, you can use Ecosim to model the implications of that for prime production. Or you can directly force the prime production, in which case uh, Ecosim will not model prime production. It will just take the values that you put in. Uh, when we're getting estimates from uh, from biogeochemical models, which is increasingly the case. Biogeochemical models that's linked to, coupled with hydrodynamic models often. Uh, a preference there is to get the primary production from it, or even the nutrients, not the zooplankton production, because in these biogeochemical models, the zooplankton's production is, mesh, is estimated with what's called a closure term which is just biomass squared, for instance, or some factor uh, exponent, uh, which is based to avoid that the zooplankton's grow in and take over the whole sea. The more often, the, the, the more they die off that way. And we can do better than that. We know more in an ecosystem model, because we don't just have the phytoplankton and the zooplankton. We also have the small pelagics and the other things that feed on uh, on the zooplankton. And when we're looking at a historic time here, in many systems, we, fisheries systems, we're working with systems where the small pelagics, be they herring or anchovy sardine, have been fished down or collapsed at some point. Now, it's reasonable to, to use an ecosystem model then to evaluate what impact would that have also on the zooplankton. So we can get that in we may be, get a better feeding pressure on the phytoplankton by uh, having zooplankton and the predators in zooplankton model explicitly. Okay, and the two last ones. Uh, is this last uh, Benguela model showing the primary production amplification an example, or have you taken it from a paper? It's a paper I never wrote. Uh, <laughs> I did this for, for a workshop. Uh, on impact of prime production years ago. Uh, Carl and I worked with uh, Lynn Shannon on the model fitting, and I just used that model. So it's, it's um, no, it's not published. But it's pretty neat. And, actually. and finally, Billy, uh, there's a couple of questions on, on, on the Facebook page. I think one uh, you're going to show us with the, the tutorial, but there's one that I think might be worth mentioning. Uh, you've talked about top-down control and bottom-up control. What about wasp waste control? Oh, well, dear friend Philip Curie. Uh, Philip Curie is is a great thinker, and uh, I think the really important part of that is that it uh, forces you. It, it makes you think about the ecosystem. Are the uh, specific groups uh, in in a system that, uh, like the Anchoveta in Peru? that has a fundamental impact on these systems um, so that the energy flow is, is, is uh, channeled through this. I would say that wasp waste is as useful as top-down and bottom-up control, which to me all are pretty useless. You know, it's not something I, uh, I, I find is very good for explaining what happens in the ecosystem. Uh, don't really, um, yeah, so um, I wouldn't know how to set up a, up a model to uh, evaluate top-down uh, uh, vast waste control. It's not being very helpful, but uh, it's reflecting that I don't know how to do it. And I'm not sure that it really is so that the Enchoveta controls the system. They are, for energy, I, I mean, it's a wonderful concept. It's fantastic to read about it, it's to think about it, and, and these systems are organized like that. I just don't see how you translate that into 
control mechanisms. Uh, they are extremely important, the engineering species. They're extremely important for energy flow and lots of other things. And Philippe Curie is, is really a great thinker. And that's what is, to me, that's the important part of this. It's not something you can translate into um, how things work in an ecosystem. Hey, so with 20 minutes to go, Billy, should we go over the tutorial? We should do that. Tutorial six. Now, let me just mention that this tutorial is also available as an assignment with some, with some questions. Let's go to Ecosim. We're going to go into Ecosim and we're going to open up the uh, model that we constructed in the first tutorial. Two weeks ago, I constructed this ecosystem model here in class. We have the model here. We're going to go to Ecosim. Going to go input. We're going to go to time series. There. Um, we're going to go import. Now you see, it's already there is already one in here with um, with the name Anchovy Bay. But now I'm going to go and go to my downloads because I download the Anchovy Bay from the uh, link provided. So I am found the Android Bay CSV, I say open, and now it's going to read it into this spreadsheet. And uh, you should check this, especially you may have problems if you uh, are using a computer that uh, uses comma or points, something else than, than this kind of decimal points. And if you, if you have changed the setting in your, uh, in your computer, you need to make sure that it's okay here. And you can see delimiter and decimal separators are up there or something, but there can be problems. It's a Windows problem. So we have it here. We have uh, six or seven time series. The last one is a dummy that we're going to be using for environmental productivity later. But other than that, we have uh, sealers, or we have effort for sealers, for trawlers. And then we have a biomass for seals and for cotton for whiting and we have a catch for shrimp. And that's it. So not nothing big and fancy. We read it in. Now it was already read in. So now it just overwrites it. So you when you work with this in Excel and you do work with an Excel or whatever spreadsheet you're using, and then save it as a CSV file. If you keep the same name, it's going to go in at the same time series and just overwrite what you have in there. So we now have some time series read in. And we can go to Output, Run Ecosim, and run it. Normally, I would also, uh, when I go in here before reading it, in, I would run the model. Now I could see my mouse again. I would run it to st oh now I can't see anything. So one thing I always do is to go to basic input. It's just, just the colors are so pastel like whatever you call that. I'm going to go in here and I'm going to go so I go into input define groups and I go to colors down the corner and I say random. I do that a few times to get something that's nice and dark. Let's see how it changes. Let's try this one. Okay. On the tab, back to run Ecosim. And magically, the course, the plot has changed. Now we can see things. And we can see some lines, something dying off, uh, some dots. Uh, so the Ecosim predictions are the lines and the dots are 
the time series we, we um, put in. You can, when you go up in the right uh, corner up there, you can actually see the contribution that each of these um, groups has to some squares. So if I click my way, my way to it, you see whales don't contribute because there's no time series. Seals are the 40 or so is one card and so on. So you can figure out how much the individual groups contribute to some square residuals. And some square residuals is our focus when we're doing time series fitting. We go to Ecosim group plots where we see, oh, a lot of small plots. So uh, a good thing to do is to go up and show plots and decide if you want to see all of those plots. I would say, let's get rid of some of them. We don't have any discards in this model, so I'm going to remove landings. Discard survival. Total discards like that. And now we have just nine plots here. Now, these group plots are really neat. They give you a lot of information about what happens in the model. It's not so that it's, uh, I just say garbage in, garbage out. It's not like, no, that's not the right word for it. It's not a black box in the sense that what happens inside is well documented, it's available, the code and so on is available. But more and even more importantly, there's so much diagnostic uh, based uh, filled in here. That's why we have a complicated. That's the benefit of having a very complicated and and capable navigator with all the different plots and so on. There's so much available. The downside of that is it's really difficult to implement that in many different languages. Uh, but that's a different story. Now what we do here, let's go to seals instead. Uh, what we see here is now to see, we see the biomass in the top left one. And then below it you have the mortality. And on this one I would like to point out here, that is, we can't hardly see it here, but when you look at these plots of mortality from the baseline to the red line, which is uh, the same here, but you can see there's a red line, that's predation mortality. And from the red line to the blue line, that's fishing mortality. And from the blue line to the black one, that's other mortality. So here everything, mortality is not explained for this group. But you can see here how its prey is varying, um, feeding time, predation mortality and so on. So there is a lot of diagnostic here that will help you when you look at the model. The one we're looking at right now is especially the biomass here. And what you see from that is that the um, line indicates the ecosim prediction. Now, if you look at that line, you see that uh, almost the seals almost double over this time period, the modeling time period of 40 years. The dots indicate that they have increased by three, four times almost during that period. So what does that tell us about carrying capacity and assumptions? The most notable thing there is that it says Ecosim thinks that we are closer to carrying capacity because it's more stable we need to move it further away from carrying capacity to make it react more. This here is done with a default vulnerability of 2. 2 means that the most seals can increase the predation mortality that they are causing on the prey is with a factor of 2. And they've increased four times, so they've probably done more than that. So this indicates we need to have a higher vulnerability for seals. We need to have an assumption of that they're because of the calling have been pushed further away from the carrying capacity. That's the lesson that comes from here.
just from looking at, at this plot. Okay, cut the next one. Uh, here you see just the opposite. You see the uh, echosim trajectory up in the top left graph indicates that cod collapses with this fishing pressure. Uh, if we go over here and we again we look at the, the second graph here. Yes. Um, from the baseline to the red line that's predation mortality. From the red line to the blue line is fishing mortality, blue to black is other mortality. So we see a big increase in fish mortality and a decrease in predation mortality. We can look on the top right graph and figure out that, oh, that's because whiting has decreased. See, predation mortality by whiting has decreased. So we can, we can see what happens here. But we're seeing a collapse in cod, and it didn't collapse according to, to the data. It has just decreased well, quite considerably. It's decreased a lot, but not that much. So. The default assumption for cod is that it's too far from carrying capacity. We need to be closer to carrying capacity. We need a more stable population. And that means lower vulnerability. We can do one more for whiting. And here we see a decline in whiting in the data. And we don't see one at all in the um, in the Ecosin formulation run. So again, it's just like cod. We need to be um, no. It's not like cod. It's like it's like seals, but the opposite. The data show a bigger decrease. The whiting is too stable. So for whiting, we're too close to carrying capacity. We need to move further away from carrying capacity to make it more unstable. Um, fishing, and it's fishing causing it. We can see predation mortality is declining. That's because uh, predation mortality is that one. That's a, what is the cod doing it? Seals is not that important. Okay, fine. As cod decline leads to less predation on writing. Uh, so, but in this case here, we need to have higher vulnerabilities for writing. That's that's what we can learn from this. I hope that's clear. So, in order to fit 1057, um, we go to fit to time series. First thing, I do, we can go in and look at sensitivity of some squares as um, Dave Chagaris and Jakob Bentley was talking about, but one thing I always do, not only do, but always do, is to use search group with time series. And there are in this model here right now only three groups with time series. And uh, what we're getting out of these are three actually three different colors, you just can't see them because there are 30 colors uh, on, on the screen. I can by decreasing this number, I can gradually make that clear that we are just talking about three different colors. See, I think you can see it now. Now you can see it. we're going to be estimating three different colors. I'm just estimating three now. I just this was just to illustrate. I do a search. It won't do it. I have no idea what's going on. So maybe, maybe we could ask the students to, to try the tutorial on their own and we can revisit this on next Tuesday or after um, this class. We record it. Tomorrow at one o'clock Pacific time. That's when we have, I have an open door session there. We're going to change that into, uh, I'm going to uh, do the tutorial tomorrow at one o'clock. If you can follow it, uh, then uh, you're most welcome to 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 join it, and it will be on Facebook live. How about that? We will continue on Thursday, so in two days, with Natalie Sapetti. Well, and then those who can, the uh, there will be the uh, tutorial tomorrow at one o'clock Pacific time. Thank you all for today.